Welcome again, and welcome to those of you who are new this hour. Uh, we are going to talk about MOOCs and ICT education, uh, disruptive or merely distracting. Uh, so this is meant to be an informal and uh, fun last session of the day, so thank you for joining me. Um, once again, I'm Una Daly. I'm the Community College Outreach Director at the Open Courseware Consortium. Um, and I work with community colleges to uh, promote the use of OER to uh, enhance faculty innovation and uh, make college more affordable. <coughs> so that's what we're going to go through. Um, and first off, we're going to have a little quiz to keep you awake here. Okay. True or false, tuition at public higher ed institutions has increased 40% in the last decade. True. Okay, who said true first? Oh, I, but I, it was either the, in the green or in the navy blue. Okay. Was it more than 40% or less than 40%? More. More. Okay, do you agree, Lisa? Um, you know you mean, oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, you guys? All right. Very good. Okay. Here's a couple of t-shirts for those two ladies. <laughs> okay. MOOCs are open educational resources that can be freely reused. No. Okay, who said sometimes? Oh my gosh. Uh, there you go. <laughs> sometimes is the answer. Um, so, um, I'll go into more detail about that. MOOCs are open enrollment, right? We can all agree on that. Um, many of them are not open um, resources, which means that you can't take those materials outside of the MOOC and reuse them. So sometimes is, is the right answer. And then colleges do not give credit for MOOCs. <laughs> I'm not sure how to answer that one. I, I think I'm going to have to come up with one at the end. I have only one last shirt here, which is a large. Uh, okay, you guys answered too many at once, so at the end I'm going to have to I'm going to have to ask a really tough question. And um, so a lot of colleges don't, but there are some some pretty big names that have started offering credit for MOOCs, uh, both in the public and private space. So there you go. All right, so sorry if this is a repeat for those of you who were with me uh, last hour. Um, open Courseware kind of kicked off this idea around open courses about a decade ago. Uh, MIT, in fact, started it. Their faculty there really wanted to advance formal and informal learning throughout the world. And, um, and what they did was they put their materials online, and now their undergraduate curriculum is essentially online. Uh, that, that has grown over the years, over the last decade, and morphed in many ways. The OCW, which is how we abbreviate it, is now 280 institutions in over 40 countries. But there have been a lot of other things that have come up too, such as MOOCs. And MOOCs are not really open courseware, although in some cases they are. And I, I'm sorry, I'm going through definitions, but I. A little bit of definition at the beginning I hope is helpful. Um, so open educational resources, which is really that umbrella, which includes courses, textbooks, uh, videos, images, they're either teaching resources, learning and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been specifically licensed with an intellectual property license that we generally use Creative Commons for. And that permits their free use or repurposing. So there were some questions at our last session about open source books and copyright. Well, an open source book, um, although the person who has written it maintains the copyright, the version that they have openly licensed has an open license, which means that you can use it without worrying about copyright violations. That's the whole point of it. It's to make it easier for us to share, for those of us who want to share. And for those who don't, they, they keep their copyright and they don't make an open license version. So um, we hope that uh, more people will want to play in that space, but it's not forcing anyone to do something they don't want to do. So what are MOOCs? I, um, I think uh, I, this, probably everybody has seen this before. They're massive, thousands of students, right? Um, the famous one, of course, is Stanford, fall of 2011, their AI course, 160,000 users. 
Um, online, most of it is online. There, but you know, that we have some models where it's been hybrid, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, open, it's open enrollment, but the content is not necessarily open. And in fact, in the big name MOOCs, uh, the content is not open. Uh, you can use it while you're taking the course. You can't take it with you. Um, and then, the, is it a course? Well, you know, when you have 150,000 students, uh, is that really an instructor? You probably have facilitators. You probably have a lot of facilitators. And do you get credit for it? And that's a big question. Um, so it, courses, so all of those terms are a little, uh, you know, they're sort of taken with a grain of salt. So I'm going to just take you through a little bit of the history and then what's been, and then the most recent things that have been happening. So um, once again, artificial intelligence was fall of 2011. For those of you who are a MOOC, who are real MOOC aficionados, you'll know that it started earlier than that. But I won't go into that because it's not particularly germane to this, to this conversation. Um, what happened in fall of 2011 was Sebastian Thrun, who is the founder of Udacity, uh, was one of the instructors for this course um, on artificial intelligence. Uh, 400 uh, students finished the course uh, in, in top ranking. They were all online students. This course was actually offered at Stanford as well to students at Stanford. None of the 400 in the top ranking uh, area were Stanford students. And Dr. Thrum said, well, you know, I think we've got something here. Um, I think we've got to run with this. There, there's a whole set of learners out there who need this, who need this kind of online learning. They either can't afford it, they can't get into Stanford. Um, and I think I've got the success. I've got the silver bullet. So he started Udacity. And within weeks, I mean literally weeks if you, if you look at it, um, edX, Harvard, and MIT got on board. In fact, actually, it was originally MIT created MITx. Within a, sh within a few weeks, Harvard had jumped on board, and they renamed it edX, uh, created also um, a MOOC platform. And the difference between um, edX and Udacity, they both focus heavily on engineering and uh, stats and math, um, is that edX is a nonprofit. Udacity is a for-profit company. Um, I don't know that it's made a lot of profit yet, but it is, it is a for-profit. And Coursera then came on board within an, an, a short period of time. How many folks have heard of Coursera? The Coursera is a very interesting one, and it's gone uh, wider, quite a bit wider and deeper, and uh, their funding is amazing. And they've actually branched out, uh, although the two founders of Coursera, as you may know, are computer science instructors at Stanford, uh, Daphne Kohler and, and Andrew Ng. Um, they now, uh, they now uh, teach, but not them exactly, but their uh, consortium has uh, social sciences, humanities, um, music, you name it. So it's, it's <coughs> in that space. And the New York Times declared it was the year of the MOOC, 2012. So that was November of 2012. We were about a year into it, a little less than a year into it. <laughs> you want to talk about the Udacity? Did they have like a problem with San Jose State? <laughs> I'm going to talk about the pilot a little bit. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I, I'm. So this is kind of the context of the MOOCs, and you and you kind of wonder why, you know, why why was this? Why did people jump on the bandwagon in 2012 in a big way? Um, well, tuition is up 42 percent actually at public institutions in the last decade. So a huge amount. Um, student debt now exceeds a trillion. Sorry to repeat these statistics for those of you who were at my last session. Average student debt is 27,000 um, upon graduation. So there's a need for, um, an, for lower cost educational solutions. Um, and there was quite a frenzy created by the MOOCs. Um, I don't know if those of you who caught in summer of 2012, the president of the University of Virginia was fired by her board of trustees because she said she wasn't sure that they were ready to have a MOOC strategy. She was rehired within three weeks. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but there, was, there was a little bit of insanity going on um, around this area. Um, the other thing that's been happening is, you know, we're how many years into a digital revolution? 
um, open educational resources are now available in, in vast quantities. Um, the Open Courseware Consortium, 280 members, I mentioned uh, 30,000 courses, uh, YouTube channel, um, 700,000 videos there available for education, um, iTunes View, huge, so growing, growing area. So this has kind of created a perfect storm. And so the first half of 2013, which was just last year, huge growth in partners for MOOCs, uh, particularly with Coursera. Um, credit options all of a sudden were starting to arise, right? So they were figuring out how to give students credit, either through certificates or through partnerships. Um, Udacity actually came up with a $7,000 uh, Master's of Computer Science um, with uh, Georgia Tech and AT&T. And that, that's a that's a pretty good savings. Um, and the Gates Foundation said, hmm, we think we should do some research around this. So um, it, it, I mentioned the partners. So Coursera was up to 70 partners then by, I think, the middle of 2013. I keep thinking that's this year. Um, and 10 US, U.S. state university systems joined on. New York, Tennessee, anyone else uh, can remember what the other one? Not California. Anyone else remember any of the other ones? Anyway, 10 of our U.S. state university systems have joined on with Coursera. Um, Udacity partnered with San Jose State, and that was announced last January. And, um, and they, they did statistics, they did introduction to computer science, and another, I think math, I think it, was, it might have been remedial math. But, um, so um, there was an announcement with the president of San Jose State and Sebastian Tron, and they were, they were just going great guns. Um, and edX uh, was continuing to create a lot of um, courses as well, a little bit slower. Like they were doing more machine learning and um, engineering things. They were starting to actually work with some of their local community colleges as well, as if you remember, uh, the community colleges back in Massachusetts. And I, they were exploring flipped classrooms along with San Jose State. Uh, what else was happening was ACE, which is the uh, American Council on Education, they actually approved six <coughs> MOOCs for credit uh, by exam. Uh, Coursera introduced their signature track. Did any of you look at the signature track or do you know what that is? Okay, sorry. The signature track uh, that Coursera introduced um, said that if a student was willing to pay $50, they could um, take a test at the end. Um, I believe it was Proctor. I don't really, yeah, I, I don't know the details of that. There was some authenticity involved, so, and they would then give the student a certificate at the end. And um, they, at the time, they claimed that they had uh, made something in excess of half a million dollars on that. So um, that, that's kind of a drop in the bucket given their funding situation, but um, they, they were um, very excited about that. The University of Maryland, University College, and I think we might even have some folks here at, at this conference, they announced that uh, they were um, going to accept credit for certain MOOCs. So if students completed the MOOCs and got a certificate, they would accept it. Georgia State did, and also Excelsior College up in um, Buffalo, New York. They're a private college, a private nonprofit college. And there were others. These are just kind of the highlights. And then how many of you heard about the California SB 520 MOOC bill? Mm -hmm. Wasn't, yeah, sorry, somebody said something? Steinbergs. Steinbergs, that's right, Daryl Steinbergs. Was that a popular bill? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was interesting. So um, how about somebody out there explain what it, what it was, what the bill was? Although I know Blaine will yell at me. I'll have to repeat what you say. Did, would anyone like to explain what, what that bill what, did, said? Yes, yeah, Lisa. Um, I'm not sure if I know that particular bill, but I know one that there, I know something that's coming down the pipe right now. I think that's when they were going to try to partner with private institutions for credit. So some of our students who were not able to get into some of our classes were able to, we're going to articulate with some of the private institutions. Absolutely. So, yeah, Lisa said, um, so, and this bill was targeted at either private institutions, be they MOOCs or other, um, there's some other private institutions that are doing community college courses. So that because there was, as we know, during the recession in particular, there was a real, uh, we had to restrict our course offerings quite a bit. So um, that was introduced in March. It actually passed the Senate in June, and then it was shelved pretty much permanently in August. Not a very popular bill. 
Um, and unfortunately, the state of California is in much better shape than it was, let's say, a year and a half ago. Um, but there was a lot happening around this, and it, and it was called the MOOC bill. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what community colleges were doing, because it, within my consortium, um, I work with over 200 colleges in 15 states. Um, we had folks who were developing MOOCs, um, some of them through funding, some of them got funded through Gates and developed those, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but some of these were developed by faculty who, out of the goodness of their heart, and they wanted to figure out how it worked, went off and developed MOOCs. And, and they were not you know, they were not full semester courses, right? These might be six weeks courses on remedial math, uh, remedial uh, reading. Um, we, we have someone in our consortium, um, I don't know, if we have some folks here from Hartnell College. Uh, Dr. Lisa Storm there developed a criminal justice MOOC. And they used Canvas, which is a free open MOOC platform. And um, they wanted to see how it affects student learning. And um, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, but they've, they've done some wonderful presentations on these. Um, there was some pedagogical innovations. Um, people are looking at competency-based. So rather than having, um, having it be uh, grades, um, you're really looking at how students are, are achieving mastery in certain areas, um, which I think really addresses, it, it, it lends itself well to a workforce development model. Um, it's, um, they're student-paced as opposed to academic quarter or semester based. So students can go at it at the level that they need. Um, some of them use game based strategies to keep students engaged. And the flipped classroom model is one that came up over and over again. Um, so what I mean by that is uh, you can watch the videos from the MOOC and then you come to the classroom and you interact with your instructor and the other students to do projects or have discussions. And so I think you know where this is going. So here we are, 2013, we're on this big peak. And then things kind of start to fall off. And so uh, actually, uh, the gentleman in the back of the room, Steve Wright, put this up yesterday. I go, darn, I had that in my presentation too. This is called the Emerging Tech Cycle. And it, it comes from Gartner, um, although I got this version off Wikipedia. So it's, so it's openly licensed. But basically, we had a technology trigger in 2011. That was the Stanford um, class, the robotics class, the AI class. And then things went crazy for about a year and a half. MOOCs were everything. It was the, you know, it was the answer to everything, right? It's sliced bread. And then eventually, we kind of headed into this. There was no way it was going to live up to that. And there was lots of deficiencies around MOOCs. Um, and so what we then entered probably this summer sometime was what we call the trough of disillusionment. So completion rates are dismal uh, for this. They range from about 5 to 15 percent on MOOCs. Um, not, I mean, our colleges do much better with our students, right? Um, the California legislation, as I mentioned earlier, it was shelved. <laughs> Sort of pretty much put on ice, I think, was what they said. Um, the Gates Foundation, uh, they, they met, I think, in November or December, all of the original fundies, uh, step fundies. I don't know if that's a real word. Uh, there was um, 14 institutions, three of which were community colleges, that were funded to, put a, to do MOOCs, uh, build the MOOCs, uh, run it, and then write, write up their, the results of their research. And it was really inconclusive. Um, I just want to go into what because the community colleges, I think, is, is of great interest to us. So Cuyahoga Community College, which many of you may know is in Ohio, quite, a, quite an innovation leader, uh, they did a basic math with gaming, with gaming strategies. Um, and they said, well, yes, gaming does engage students. And they put a lot of effort into the interactive model and the graphics for that course. And they put it out in a MOOC. I think the, the, the question was, well, they probably could have done that without putting it into a MOOC platform. But at, at any rate, um, it, they found that, you know, those gaming strategies were pretty successful with students. Now St. Jacinto, which is a, which is a sorry, California college, um, did, the, did the writing course. And they really enjoyed doing it. I found it was a, a wonderful learning experience for both faculty and students. But it, it really required a lot of faculty ment mentors to make it work well. That's the one that Pat Dean was involved in. Pat James. Pat James. That's right. Yeah. We yeah. saw it at the curriculum conference. I just wanted to make sure it was the one I was thinking of. Yeah, absolutely. And then Wakefield College, which is in either North or South Carolina, they did another basic math one. And um, 
the only comment I saw from that in the news article about the conference was it was expensive to develop and there's no real clear revenue, so, which is which is another uh, beef people have with MOOCs is like there really is no model yet. Yes, Pat. Was that, um, the way the way it was also a basic math. Basic math. Yeah, it was also like a remedial math. So. Um, <laughs> When I wrote up the description of this, I said I'd, I'd weigh in on what the pundits had to say. Well, so the Gates Foundation, they've been looking at the results of this, you know, this uh, big thing that they kicked off this research, and, and they really feel that the flipped classroom um, has some merit with MOOCs. And so they, I believe they're going to fund some more of this. And in fact, we saw that. San Jose State, although their pilot was pretty much shelved this summer, the one with Udacity. In fact, in the cases where they used MOOCs in a hybrid mode, the students did better. Those students in a hybrid MOOC where they watched the videos and then came into the classroom and worked with the instructor and their other peers uh, did better than students who attended traditional classes in the same areas. And so that was an introduction to computer science, stats, and, and I think remedial math, but I honestly don't remember the third one. So, so in fact, there is some data to suggest that the flipped classroom and a MOOC in a MOOC environment can be um, a learning outcome improvement. Stephen Downs, I don't know how many of you know him, he was involved in the original MOOCs, which I didn't take time to talk about. He's a Canadian. Um, and he actually attended our, um, our online teaching conference in California here uh, in yeah, last June, which was kind of fun uh, to have him come and talk. And he, he, he has weighed in on community colleges too, and I just thought I'd share it with you. So he says that the really key thing about MOOCs is that it's open access. This is the first time where these materials are out there. Um, <laughs> openly, act, you can openly access and you can openly enroll. As I mentioned earlier, most of these MOOCs materials are not open in the sense that you can take them with you. So Stephen Downs is saying they should also be that. They should be open educational resources in addition to open access. I don't think Coursera and Udacity will go that way, though, just to be honest with you. Um, and his, his idea was that you, know, you want to think of a MOOC as kind of a, a hackathon. It's a way to get students involved and excited. And from once, and, and it's open free enrollment, right? From once you get them excited about that, then you start talking about the certificates and, uh, and degrees and, and actually enrolling in that. And there's been some different models in open courseware that show that this can be effective. Students take these open courses originally and then they click through and enroll at that institution because they see what the materials are like, they see what it is to the assessments are like, and then they, they, they take the step of actually enrolling in college. Was there any um, data to support whether that was happening? With these MOOCs, no. Uh, that I, there, there has been, a, this last summer, Broward College in Florida, community college in Florida, offered a remedial online MOOC. Uh, it was remedial reading and math and prepping you for your placement exams at the community college. I don't have the results from that yet. Um, to see if it caused a click through. But the idea was that for students who either haven't been in college in a long time and need to get back up to speed, or perhaps students who barely graduated high school, uh, they could go through a MOOC and then if they pass that, they could go on and actually enter college level courses. Which is a pretty exciting idea. I don't think we have the proof yet, but there's some hope for that one. So we're in the trough. We're entering 2014. So is, is, there, is there a scope of enlightenment? So we're, we're going now with the Gartner model here. So what can we take away from this discussion? And yes, go ahead. I mean, I, I don't want to kind of state the obvious here. But isn't it obvious that there is a role for the move? Isn't that like unbelievably obvious? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, seriously, does anybody here think that a MOOC is like a bad idea and it should never occur? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, that's a very pointed question. I think that if, if I asked some of you to step outside, you'd probably tell me they were a bad idea. Well, who, though? Like a teacher who's the yes. other job? Yes, right? because... But that's not a student. And that's how people were taking a move? Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, I have two, and I, my conclusion in the perspective of community college students, uh, I think I think uh, what you were saying about maybe the four week media uh, ones, but the ones that was through for Sarah is in the UCR Valley. 
And um, it was really interesting. But I think mean, without any adjunct support help and the bit and having to do peer study, it was just I don't want to use it. And it's but you're supposed to like crop but it's more like, okay, I, I got some information but not really enough to be so yeah, so uh, just to re repeat the question, I'm sorry, what's your name? Dave. Dave. So Dave um, said, why would anyone think that MOOCs are a bad idea? And, oh, and no, 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 no
it's just amazing the network that's happening. So I think there's some value in that to research and study that out. And a lot of employers are starting to look at MOOCs because this is a way for them to train their workforce. Mm -hmm. And then they can say, well, did you go through this MOOC? And then maybe you move up the salary scale. And basic skills. That's another thing that a lot of people are interested in. How can MOOCs help us with the basic skills that our students don't have when they come to our college? Yeah. And the jury's still out, but they're, they are promising for sure. I, I wanna, since I, I want to get through my slides, I only have a couple more, and then I'll, I'll open this up wider. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that most folks feel there are some positives um, from, um, from the MOOC experience. Um, professional development is obviously a, a key one. Um, for faculty who are teaching online, looking at these different pedagogical models, um, it was kind of interesting. Um, at Harvard University, I think it was uh, last fall, they said, well, you know, these MOOCs are great, but we think we're going to do SPOCs. And those are small private online courses. And we were all sort of kind of laughing and saying, well, gosh, we've been doing that for 15 years at the community college. Maybe we could teach Harvard as an but, uh, so, But it is leading to innovation in different ways, in different spaces. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I, I personally know several of these faculty who developed MOOCs um, because uh, they wanted to see how this would affect the learning of their students. Um, and both Arizona uh, at Scottsdale's and Hartnell College here in California and over in Seattle College, they did a history MOOC. And they weren't funded through Gates, which is interesting. Um, it can attract new students. Um, we were talking about beyond the traditional college students. Um, obviously, um, overseas folks are enrolling in this in large proportions. And um, in some cases, people are getting organized, and they, uh, they actually will come and watch the videos together of a MOOC. And um, I don't know if they do their homework together or what, but they actually come, and, and so they create kind of a classroom around this MOOC. And, some, and this is actually being done in some businesses. I don't know that it's being done in the U.S., but I've heard that it's being done overseas, where they're coming in as a group into their business and watching the news, maybe at lunchtime or something. Um, <laughs> um, high school. Uh, there are high school students who are taking MOOCs in ICT and learning a lot of things uh, that maybe aren't offered at their local high school. So uh, another potential use. Um, workforce was mentioned. University of California, Irvine has been a big open ed supporter and they've also done uh, several MOOCs, um, some really uh, interesting ones like they, what is it, it's the, uh, the Walking Dead. So they did a MOOC all about that uh, TV show, Walking Dead. Uh, they, they've, done, they've done academic MOOCs as well. And what they found is that 12% of the prospective undergrads and grad students preview open curriculum. So we know this is a marketing tool. It brings students in. It also attracts faculty. Uh, faculty want to be seen as going to an institution of innovation. So from an institutional strategy, there are a lot of benefits. And um, I don't know how many of you are administrators, but thinking about that is something um, that um, could lead you to have a big strategy. Um, institutional exposure. Um, there's obviously it can it can bring current it can bring students in it can attract students that are outside the traditional boundaries um, faculty innovation faculty are exploring all these different pedagogical ways to support assessment and learning uh, you can identify your college as a leader in this space and then it's an opportunity for public service because this is open to the community so uh, and to the world as a matter of fact and it's an opportunity for academic research, and I think we, we can all agree that there's a lot more research that needs to be done in this area. And um, I'm just going to open it up now to questions for the last five minutes. I know there was some, yeah, well, Steve. I know the first word is massive, you know, uh, so I, I guess the question is, should we really differentiate between online videos of educational nature and massive, which implies to me that some superstar lecturer from some a prestigious uh, uh, college or something like that. So in your evaluation of MOOCs, are you looking at, at those characteristics? Because if the last example you gave is any college can do this, but a MOOC would have to be massive, which means it has to have a large following. Um, 
Well, I, 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 there is a big difference between the online courses that we offer at our colleges now in a MOOC. And um, I think there's been a lot of thought and development that have gone into the online courses that we offer at our college. There's all that interaction, that personal contact with the students, which helps make our students successful. MOOCs really don't do that in general. In, in fact, for those of folks who have developed MOOCs, uh, particularly on the Canvas platform, the instructional designers who will work with you will tell you, you want to limit your, um, your interaction with students. If you have 2,000 students, which many of them do, you can't interact with all of them. Now, you said the marketing piece, how do people find out? There's, um, there's, a, there's a lot of different lists that have, um, that have the MOOCs that are being offered. Um, one's called Class Schedule. Um, it, Canvas itself will help you promote your MOOCs. Um, Canvas, do you know what the Canvas platform is? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. And for those of you who don't, it's an LMS which offers a MOOC platform as well as a for service platform that uh, quite a few colleges have adopted. So, um, but th there are ways to um, let people know about what you're doing. Was that your question, Steve? Well, I, my question is, and I think the threatening part of MOOCs is that it, it attracts the students towards other centers of, of, of knowledge and, and away from of the local uh, training. Right. But if you think of it in terms of uh, distance ed that we might provide ourselves, it's not so threatening. Exactly. And that's why I think that there's an institutional decision that needs to be made about whether MOOCs might make sense at your college. Yes, Pat. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the perspective of hours put into developing courses that are free. And I'm thinking about, you know, uh, you know, all of us in the country and we're just scrambling for, we still are scrambling for funding. And I have to have a minimum number of students before, I mean, that are paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, my, so I then I thought of, well, you had talked about the medial, is the role of MOOCs going to be possibly replacing some of our tutorial centers or, or in it, or, you know, because some, there's support for some of those services because their non-credit um, have kind of gone down. Right. At least that's in our district. So I'm thinking, well, is that the role of MOOCs? Are we going to put the faculty members there to just kind of be once to develop these and give them a brief time or give them... So I, I don't know. I, I, mean, I mean, it's a possibility. I mean, I, I, I can see how they can be complementary with the tutorial center. But as you know, many colleges have closed their okay. tutorial centers. Is the tutorial center the same as a, a blended course? You know, we have part of it's online and part of it's uh, a tutorial or a MOOC. I'm well, sorry. I'm asking. I'm asking whether um, whether uh, this tutorial center is equivalent to a blended uh, type of course with some of the No, no. Um, totally different. Most okay. colleges have on-site tutorial centers, although in the, and I'll let other folks correct me. But in in recent years, people have gone to online tutorial services, either consortiums where students can call up and get help either through a college consortium or a private company. So, um, or to CCC confer. They can, CCC confer. They can okay. talk to their faculty, you mean, members? Yeah. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So and I think what Pat was referring to was the possibility of MOOCs um, providing some of the same services as a tutorial center. Yeah. One of the complaints sometimes about uh, distance education, too, is, is some of the supplementary services, and I'm wondering if the MOOC would kind of sell for that. But I was really thinking in terms of the cutting of tutorial centers and the cutting of funding for them, and would MOOCs be possible um, adjunct or replacement for some of those? I haven't heard that, and it, um, uh, as they currently stand, I don't see that as being a real positive thing. But I, you know, somebody could come up with that. I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't write. I wouldn't email it to your chancellor or anything. <laughs> wait, wait a sure question up front there. Yeah, it seems to me yeah. where they really could be useful is in uh, satisfying prerequisites for courses and bringing all of your students up to a given level so that you can all at least start off together instead of having. Uh, you know, teaching to the low end or teaching to the high end or teaching to the middle, you take the low end and if everybody takes the MOOC 
to sort of establish that they have a baseline of knowledge needed to proceed through a course can sort of give your low end students the impetus to, oh gosh, I've got a, a long way to go and, and bring everybody up, up to a level so you wouldn't spend so much time trying to help the people at the low end to keep up. Absolutely. I was at a session uh, here before lunch and they were talking about students who come in and take computer science and they haven't had any binary math before. Um, that might be a perfect case of learning binary math to a MOOC. Um, it's, it's a fairly uh, simple, I mean it, it could take somebody a while, but it, it, it's encapsulated. Yeah, it's an interesting idea, yeah. So I guess I'm going to be the naysayer here. So um, is there data that, that shows that students have that sort of a low end persist yeah, and actually get? No. I mean, because see, that is my worry. What, yeah. what I don't like about MOOC is it has been counted as the panacea for those students. And I, I, I totally disagree. That that's going to be the case. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a lazy way out of saying, here, take care of them. By saying, here, just go out and take your online course, and no one finishes. Yeah. And then there's really issues. Who's there helping? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I completely agree with you. <laughs> can, you uh, can you hold the uh, questions long enough to put the applause on the recording? <laughs> <laughs> I have one last t-shirt to give away and I'm trying to